I am Rose Lim and moderator of this webinar. We all are here for a wonderful webinar on stigma around mental health. We know that mental health stigma is refers to the negative attitudes and stereotypes of society. 70% of people are affected by them and knowledge of this is very crucial because it empowers individuals and fosters empathy and cooperation leading to improved quality of life. Our speaker is Petrina Montrose from London. Here is short introduction about her. Over the past six years, she has worked in the criminal justice system. She has been chosen to present complex cases and she has worked on two other mentors. In addition, she is working in forensic psychology. She also contributes to contribute to work. She has been invited to guest lecturers on early childhood risk factors. She has served as an expert on the experience review of panel for modern slavery and human rights policy and evidence centers at the British Institute of International and Comparative Law. And currently she is a forensic psychologist and survival leader. A big welcome from all of us to our speaker. Hello, hello everybody. Can before I start, can you all hear me? Okay, good afternoon everybody. Thank you very much. I'm talking from London time. So I'd like to begin this webinar. Thank you very much to Women Ascension and Damajul for inviting me. So stigmatization, before I start, I just want to introduce a little something. Stigmatization is a complex and pervasive issue that affects individuals and communities in various ways. Now, it can arise from misunderstandings, fear, stereotypes, which we will be discussing, or misconception, and it often leads to discrimination and exclusion. So one of the most effective ways to combat stigma is by fostering a sense of community, which is what we are here today, all of us. So when we come together, like we are in this shared space, we are sharing experiences and we are supporting one another. And this becomes a powerful force for dismantling stigma. So welcome everyone. So I'd like to start um, by addressing um, the objective of this webinar, which is to raise awareness and to understand about stigma and its forms. Secondly, is to promote empathy and understanding the consequences of stigma on mental health outcomes. And three, the last objective is to encourage, and very importantly, inclusive language, behavior, challenges, harmful stereotypes, and misconceptions that are pervasive within our communities today and within us individually. So what is stigma? So stigma with S, we're looking at stereotyping. And this is an oversimplification or an exaggeration, a sensationalization of traits. The T, we can look at it as a threat. We view individuals that have mental health challenges as threats or dangers, or we inadvertently blame people. I is for ignorance. There is a pervasive lack of understanding or misinformation within our societies and within the media. There is guilt. There is huge associated shame and blame with all forms of mental health conditions. And lastly, there is marginalization. There is the exclusion and the pure isolation that individuals experience when they're suffering from mental health. Now, there are different forms of stigma, and I think these are really important to differentiate and to aid and facilitate understanding. So social stigma. Now, social stigma surrounds mental health and um, it elicits shame, as we've discussed, isolation and inequality. Now, breaking silence about social stigma promotes empathy and it actually dismantles um, stigma and it fosters, as I mentioned, an inclusive community. Now, self-stigma, 
which is, um, may I just say that an example of social stigma, just to, to help understanding, is that, for example, individuals with mental health conditions, they, we, they can be labelled as crazy or unstable, which leads to the assumption or the inference that they're unable to perform their jobs or they're able to engage in social activities and this type of stigma results in social isolation which is um which is what we find in the limited access to healthcare and support services now self stigma is an internalized negative belief and shame about one's own mental health condition it involves self-blame, self-doubt, and reduced self-worth, and it perpetuates self-talk and isolation. Now, self-stigma has a significant impact on a person's mental health and well-being. When individuals internalize negative beliefs and attitudes about themselves, they may experience pervasive sense of shame, um, low self-esteem, and this leads to social withdrawal. And this then leads on to an increased symptoms of mental health conditions and a decreased motivation to seek treatment and support. Structural stigma is systemic barriers in healthcare, education and employment, and this perpetuates um, mental health discrimination, it exacerbates inequalities, and it is seen in our current policies and practices, and it reinforces harmful um, stereotypes, whether that's um, intentionally or unintentionally, but it limits its access to resources and care for marginalized and vulnerable communities. We have cultural stigma, there's another form of stigmatization, and that's societal norms and values that perpetuates shame, silence, and stereotypes around mental health. And it's fueled by media and media depictions and representations and cultural expectations. Now, this leads to delayed treatment, isolation, and suffering in diverse communities. And particularly, again, among marginalized, vulnerable subpopulations. And then we have digital stigma. Now, digital stigma um, can manifest itself in things like online harassment, cyberbullying, and social media shaming. It perpetuates um, mental health stigma because it amplifies harmful stereotypes and it exacerbates isolation. Now, online, online platforms and algorithms reinforce stigma and it limits, limits access to digital mental health resources and support. So social media may serve as a particularly important role in shaping individuals' mental health stigma and perceptions of stigma and attitudes are greatly adversely affected by digital stigma. And I can give you just one example because I'm aware of time, but um, there was a, a sample of Twitter users and I think there was 1,101 posts that Twitter related to severely commonly stigmatized disorders, schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, autism, eating disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder and addiction for stigmatizing content. Now, a large proportion of the posts were rated as stigmatizing with some conditions more than others. So there's this huge disparities that exist that are fueled by misconceptions and stereotypes that digital stigmatization is having, I think, the greatest, most profoundest effect in creating all these things that we're talking about today. So the question is for you, for my, um, what form of stigma do you think um, has the most significant impact on mental health and why? You can put that in the drop box uh, if anybody would like to suggest what you think that is, but I can tell you. It's, it's, it's actually structural stigma. Um, and the research suggests and the literature suggests that 67.5% of the disparities and the stigmatization of mental health is due to um, structural stigma. And this is seen mostly in Pakistan, China, Nigeria, South Africa, Brazil, and India. 
So the consequences of stigma on mental health outcomes um, are far reaching. And I'm just going to show you what they are. Right. So the consequences of stigma on mental health, mental health outcomes. Firstly, when we look at the individual level, we have a delayed or foregone treatment. So we have a reduced self-esteem and confidence. We have social isolation and loneliness. We have increased symptoms and relapse. We have decreased adherence to medication. We have poor mental health um, literacy. And we have an internalized shame and self-blame. And we have suicidal thoughts, ideation and behaviors. On a social level, what the research suggests are the consequences of stigma on mental health outcomes are social exclusion and marginalization, discrimination in employment, education and housing. We have stigma by association through our family, our friends, so relationally. We have reduced social support networks and we have the perpetuation of harmful stereotypes. Now, another consequence of stigma on mental health outcomes is in our healthcare. And we have, the research clearly shows that there's an inadequate training for healthcare professionals. There's insufficient resources and funding. We have a limited access to specialized care. We have poor diagnosis and treatment quality, and we have an inadequate follow-up care. And another area is um, economic consequences and these are increased health care costs. We have lost productivity and workforce participation. We have reduced economic growth. We have an increased social welfare costs and ultimately we have a decreased quality of life. Now there are things that we can do and one of the things that is quite conclusive is that we can have empathy building strategies. So what are empathy building strategies? Well these are we can share personal stories and experiences. We can listen actively without judgment. We can educate ourselves and others on mental health conditions. We can use um, inclusive and respectful language. We can encourage open conversations and we can ultimately challenge stereotypes and misconceptions. And we can support mental health advocacy. So we can also um, engage in empathy building activities such as role play. Um, there are lots of things that we can do actually, and language is very important actually. What we can do, for example, what we can say is we can say, thank you for being vulnerable. Thank you for opening up. Thank you. Is there anything I can do to help? You know, I'm sorry to hear that. That must have been very difficult. Um, I cannot imagine, you know, what you are going through. You know, you can ask to help. Can, can I can I drive you to an appointment? Or actually, how are you how are you feeling today? But what we don't want to say is that it it could be worse. You know, just deal with it. Or everyone everyone sometimes feels that way. Or you may have brought this on yourself. Or you know. Think happier thoughts, you know, pull yourself together. Um, this is not the kind of language that creates inclusivity. So we also, when we're looking at stereotypes, these are weaknesses, these are sort of like mental illness is perceived as a weakness. Yeah, it's um, seen as a personal failing um, of the person. Um, and this evokes shame and mental health issues are frequently, as I've mentioned, stigmatized, and this leads to feelings of guilt and shame. Violence, people with mental illnesses are unfairly portrayed as violent or unpredictable. There are so many challenges with this subject, um, but we can discuss some, this is not an exhaustive list, but this is, there is social isolation. So stigma leads to social withdrawal and loneliness, delays in seeking help, 
there's a fear of judgment that prevents individuals from, from seeking timely treatment. There's a lack of support. There's an inadequate support from family, friends and community, and this exacerbates mental health struggles. There is self-stigma, which is the internalizing negative stereotypes that really do significantly worsen one's um, mental health. There are media misrepresentations. There are sensationalized media portrayals that perpetuate harmful stereotypes. There are cultural and societal norms. Cultural beliefs and societal expectations can contribute significantly to stigma. And language, as I've mentioned, language that perpetuates stigma, crazy, insane. Well, this has shown to harm individuals and communities. And, you know, so how can you do it? Well, we can do education and awareness campaigns. There are personal storytelling and advocacy. There's inclusive language and representation. There's increased accessibility to mental health services and their supportive community networks. We can encourage open conversations and we can challenge harmful stereotypes and media portrayals. And we can foster empathy and understanding. It's a short overview, but there's a lot there. So I hand it back to you if there's any questions or anything that you'd like to ask. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katrina. Um, it was it was beautiful and you um, covered very important areas where we need to have a conversation today with all of the candidates. So I would request um, to everybody to write in the chat box if they cannot unmute themselves so we can share and Miss Katrina can um, reply to that individually. For me, Petrina, I have genuinely one question. Um, uh, just consider I am a person who's newly trying to build myself and I've been going through a lot um, at my personal life. So how could I deal with the challenges outside though I'm struggling at home? Because these are the scenarios I observe a lot around in my community and they don't open up because they don't want to, you know, have those fingers around them. So considering me as that person, what would you advise me? Well, the problem that we have is, thank you very much, and thank you for sharing. Um, the problem that we have is that if we internalize our problems or we internalize shame, if we struggling and we aren't able to communicate and we don't feel that we can talk to people or seek help, there really is things that you can do by what, or particularly in my lived experience of experiencing a lot of mental health troubles with my past, is that we can surround ourselves with very positive people that empower us. There are a lot of self-help measures that we can use that are online, resources. There's a lot of ways that we can facilitate and get help. We can read and understand, you know, reading and understanding mental health and stigma greatly um, increases awareness and also gives you an insight into why you may feel the way that you do, because it takes away self-blame. And very often what happens when we fall into places where we can feel quite helpless or powerless to be able to change or initiate change, sometimes um, we have the luxury now of a digital world. We can go and we can listen to an expert and we can educate ourselves or and that greatly helps and that also may open up the an opportunity that you may be able to perhaps you know talk to somebody or I always urge people to seek some form of um, therapy or some form of intervention whether that's psychological mindfulness something that just um, you know helps to validate how you're feeling. Thank you Miss Petrina. Uh, Miss Petrina Ziba is asking, um, is anger a kind of stress? I beg your pardon, sorry? Is anger a kind of stress? It's Ziba's question. Is anger a kind of stress? Yes, I would say anger is a very stressful 
and a really very unhealthy behavior and, and a, a very tormenting to experience. Um, how would you like me to answer that? I would say, yes, it is. It's it's very stressful to feel angry. Yes. And when you dysregulate like that, so anger is a way of dysregulation. So it's finding a way that you can regulate your emotions again. So that can often be finding a safe space with somebody that you trust, that you can, that you can share. But actually, it's about dysregulation and not perhaps putting yourself around in a situation that may trigger anger or look or try and get to, before you feel the, it's just the emotion, try and find ways of um, dysregulating before. So if you know that something is going to trigger you, then, then, you know, avoid it, you know, learn about your triggers, learn the areas that you know that will exacerbate if there is any trauma or anger. And therefore that, that, that I find really helps. Thank you, Katrina. There's another question from Miss Lucy, and she's asking that how can I help a depressed person who is failing to conceive? Who is failing to concede, did you conceive? Did you say? Conceive, yes. Um, yeah, conceive. Con concede or conceive? <laughs> conceive. Uh, able to have, you know, could baby. You, could, you, could you explain a little bit more? You mean <laughs> not I, wanting to get help? Not wanting to get help? Um, I think the person is in a complete depressed, depressed state because she is trying to conceive and she is not able to get conceived. And I think she is not there to have a conversation that she needs help too right now. So how she can start the conversation with that individual? Really good question. Well, with that, thank you for asking the question. There isn't a right or wrong answer for that. You know, that's the very deep um, seated feeling of, you know, a lot of emotions will be going on there with, with, you know, so, oh, I would, if you don't feel that you can talk to somebody that you can trust, then, see, the, the point of all of this is, is that, it is to open up the ability to be able to seek help. We can't really ultimately do this by ourselves. We need help and we need support. So there are, I would, in this particular um, instance, I would go to somebody that I could trust and I would find that um, I wouldn't know how to advise on that. With it. I hope I've heard the question correctly with it, with conceiving. Yes, not conceiving. yes. Yeah, that, even I have had, of time where I can conceive. Um, so I do empathize if that's the case, but um, I'm afraid I, I wouldn't know how to advise that except to say that, you know, there is lots of help. And if you could find somebody that you could trust or go to an expert or a medical yeah. expert and look at ways that you could perhaps empower yourself to, to believe that it's possible unless you've been told that you can't conceive. So I probably need more context with the question and it's it's out of my remit. I miss the work, but for I don't, I wouldn't. I hope that helps. Paul. Thank you, thank you, Katrina. And yes, it's sometimes you know it's very challenging when people try to you know shut themselves up. It's become very complicated to yeah. start that conversation. You know, um, of course, true. All right, there is another question from Behishta, and she is asking that. What are some practical ways to deal with cultural stigma, which is really out of our control? That's a really good question. The cultural stigma that is out of your control. Well, you, truthfully, the way that you can you can deal with it is by raising awareness, by being an advocate, by looking and raising the disparities that exist within cultures and informing people of what is um, discrimination and, and what is prejudicial thinking. So this is this is an area that we can only raise awareness and advocate for um, 
Otherwise, there isn't really anything else that you can do. Because if you look at it from the perspective of, for example, I'll give you an example, look at it from if we have stereotypes and prejudices and we look at it in the context of culture, well, people with mental illness are often perceived as, as we've talked about, dangerous, they're incompetent, they're to, to blame for their disorder and they're unpredictable. And this internalizes itself and the self, I'm dangerous, incompetent to blame. And then we have the structural, which is that the stereotypes are often embodied in our laws and other institutions. But the discrimination comes in because Therefore, this is where we see that these thoughts may lead to a low self-esteem and self-efficacy, and then why try? Someone like me isn't worthy or unable to. So we need to challenge people. We need to challenge cultural misinformation and mental health stigma. This leads to, so for example, we need to, yeah, we need to, we need to find our voices you know, inclusive language and conscious communication. I mean, language has the power to perpetuate or challenge stigma. So using inclusive and respectful language can help create a more inclusive and empathic facility. So I would suggest in anything that is cultural, um, change it, you know, because um, social media, you know, is, is a powerful tool. So yes, I would I would challenge it, my friend, you know, to speak and, and raise awareness and, and, ch and challenge it and foster inclusivity. So inclusive communities send a strong solidarity message that everybody is welcome, welcomed and valued, regardless of our background or, or cultures. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. And may I one last point? Yes, uh, yes, please. Yes. Is that communities that celebrate communities that celebrate individuals who overcome stigma, they highlight um, success stories that inspire others that face similar challenges and they show that stigmatization can be defeated. So the recovery community, for instance, it honors those who have conquered, um, conquered addiction and it offers hope to others on their journey. So the community is the role in dismantling stigma and this is where it provides the support and it challenges stereotypes. So um, again, it's this wonderful community that we build and we again advocate for change. Thank you, Katrina. And you know, Beheshta is from um, Afghanistan and most of the, um, our sisters in the community in Afghanistan, they are facing um, to exhibit the true rights over there. So I think one of the most frustrating points for them would be they cannot control this factor that Absolutely. has been, you know, um, put on them. That's really true. To have that conscious conversation among, you know, their circle, That's it. that would be definitely a great help for them. All right. So, yeah. all right. So we have one more question, Katrina. Um, the question is, um, it's from Jannat. Uh, from a personal standpoint, how have you navigated mental health stigma in your own life? What coping mechanisms or support system have helped build your resilience? Only if you want to share them with us. Yes, no, 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 absolutely. Um, well, what, as you know, I discussed that I was trafficked as a minor from a very young girl um, and I was trafficked into prostitution where I stayed for a very long time. So I really do understand stigma and mental health. I had tremendous mental health challenges. How I did this was I actually educated myself out of it. So I had no education at all, no familial support. I was, um, I was I couldn't read or write properly. I was, I was in, so I took myself and spent 14 years educating myself so that I could find a voice. And I think education for me has been key. It's been vocational. In that process, I have empowered myself because what happens when we come from this place of powerlessness and helplessness is that we don't feel that change is possible um, because we don't have a deep understanding of, of what it is the challenges are that we're facing. 